Hello students, welcome to today's integrated session of radiology and orthopedics. I am Dr. Rishabh Jain, your radiology faculty and today I have with me Dr. Yusuf Ali who is your orthopedics faculty at Allen. So we have come today with an integrated orthopedics and radiology session. So as to better help you attempt questions because nowadays the pattern of questions is more towards clinical oriented and various integrated questions come in the exam. Sir, what's your opinion? Yeah, thank you very much, sir, for your introduction. Exactly. Very rightly said that now we are having the integrated questions and yes. each and every uh, question is, cannot be obtained out of an individual subject. Yes. So this integrated session probably is going to help you out in finalizing the answer for your question in particular. Sir, the first question. Of so 29 year old male presented to the OPD with a discharging sinus in the right leg in mid third of region. History of occasional bony specule draining out of the sinus with past history of a uh, past history reveals trauma, swelling and intermittent treatment, which is the incorrect option. So first option is rim sign on MRI is diagnostic. Sequestrum is identified on X-rays for diagnosis. Cyanogram is useful for identifying the cloaca. And D options, a sequestrectomy by small window opening in the bone is the management of choice. So what do you think is the answer to this question? Now let's just briefly dissect the question first, sir. Um, as it is very clearly mentioned that there is a history of the sinus from the and there is a draining of the sequestra. That means the bone is coming out of the sinus. So once these two things coupled in the form of a question are provided to you, then answer for the question is very certain that it yes. is chronic osteomyelitis that we are talking yes. about. So sinus is very, very specific. Draining sinus coming out of a bony specule is very, very specific of chronic osteomyelitis. And as far as the past history reveals means it is very in the form of the short form it is being mentioned because every time you get a question related to chronic osteomyelitis there will be a past history provided in the form of trauma right intermittent management maltreatment or ill treatment or incomplete treatment because every acute osteomyelitis when it is inappropriately managed will be converted into chronic, chronic osteomyelitis, osteomyelitis. Uh, so sir let's talk yeah. about the first option then so if the coming to the imaging first so rim sign on mri is diagnostic this is the option now this is a correct option because the rim sign that we are talking about so what is a rim sign so suppose this is the bone and this is the bony focus of infection that we are talking about in chronic osteomyelitis so as we know that in the center of the bone we have what we call it is the dead bone and surrounding that we have the reactive sclerosis right now this reactive sclerosis since it's a sclerosis now remember any sclerosis whenever you heard the word sclerosis on mri all sclerosis are t2 dark okay and t2 dark surrounding a dead bone in the center will appear like a rim sign now this is the rim sign that we are talking about now second option is sequestrum is identified on x-ray for diagnosis yes remember sequestrum is the hallmark of chronic osteomyelitis whenever uh, you hear the word sequestrum first it is a diagnosis that you pick up on x-ray and second remember it is a hallmark of uh, chronic osteomyelitis what is sequestrum sequestrum is nothing but the dead bone now coming to three sinogram is useful for identifying the cloaca now what is sinogram so since there is a sinus which is draining into the skin surface, you can put in a needle, you can put in a cannula through it and inject contrast and see the communication beautifully into the dead cavity that is there in the bone. And finally coming to the management, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, like in case of chronic osteomyelitis, you know, sequestrum is the hallmark. For yes. the, because if at all the sequestrum is present inside the bone, it cannot be managed adequately until and unless the sequestrum is removed. So sequestrum as sir has said that this is a sequestrum which is identified as a dead sclerotic bone which is present in the pool of the uh, this uh, granulation tissue. This has to be removed. Now there are two ways of removing it. Like if, if we talk about the management and in the bone we are having this sequestrum which is surrounded by the granulation and the involucral tissue. So two ways of removing it either we put a small window and then curate everything out. Right. That is procedure A. And the second one is moving a large segment of the bone out, creating a large win larger window and then removing everything out. That is procedure B. Now, it seems that procedure A is better because we are creating a small defect in the bone. But if we do like procedure A, where a small window is opened inside the bone, then in future, if there is a formation of the abscess, it is likely to get collected inside the bone. It won't drain out. It won't drain out readily. But in case of procedure B, because of the larger cavity which has been created, so none of the abscess is likely to get collected inside the 
bone and it will be readily drained out. And whenever there is a collection of the abscess in the soft tissue, it could be managed easily in comparison to the abscess inside the bone. Right. So procedure B is far better compared to procedure A. And that is the reason why the principle of the management is sequesterectomy by saucerization. Now saucerization means, we know all of us, we have seen a cup and a saucer. Now cup has got a small opening, a narrow opening. The saucer has got a shallow opening. And this is the reason why we are creating a shallower opening inside the bone. So sequesterectomy by saucerization is the principle of the management for chronic, chronic osteomyelitis. As the other options are concerned, sir, rim sign is true. Sequestrum is the identified for the making the diagnosis. Sinogram is also for the identification of the cloche. Uh, sequesterectomy by small window opening in the bone is the management? No. Sequesterectomy by relatively larger window which has been created in the form of saucerization. So this is the image of the uh, sinogram that is being done. So you can see here that there is a cannula which is injecting the contrast into the dead bone and you can beautifully see how this uh, contrast is getting collected within the dead bone cavity. Now this dead bone cavity which we see here in this image. <coughs> now this red area that I am marking, this lucent area is the dead bone that is the sequestrum. Okay. And the sclerosing bone, this white white yellow yellow area that I am marking. Okay. This yellow yellow area. This is the sclerosed part. This is the reactive sclerosis around the dead, dead bone. This is known as the involucrum. Okay. And similarly, you can see on the MRI that in the center, what you see here is the dead bone that is the sequestrum. And in the surrounding, the sclerosed part, this black black area, this black black area, this is the involucrum which appears T2 dark and hence the name the rim sign. Now, moving on to the next question. So, which of the following is incorrect regarding DDH. So, DDH stands for developmental dysplasia of hip. So, sir will read the answer to this question. Now, this is the kind of the question which are likely to gain more and more traction as far as your examinations are concerned because uh, developmental dysplasia of hip. If we talk about option wise, sir, like the first option is that originally the condition was called as congenital dislocation of the hip. That is true because if we look at the pathophysiological mechanism of developmental dysplasia of hip, it is a developmental abnormality where the acetabulum is relatively shallower in comparison to the head of the femur. Now, both of them have to be complementary to each other. If the acetabulum is relatively shallower, then the ability to hold the head of the femur within its confines would be lesser and there is always a possibility of dislocation. Now, imagine a child who is born and at the time of birth, it is already dislocated. So we have diagnosed the condition. But what about those children where dysplastic acetabulum is present, but the dislocation has not yet happened. Right. So in order to screen those child, in order to identify, identify those children, there is a change in the terminology from congenital dislocation to developmental dysplasia. Display. So that we have to screen each and every child where we are suspicious that this child could be having or could be suffering from acetabular dysplasia. Right. So that is option number one. It is true that previously it was called as congenital dislocation, but in order to include more and more children into the spectrum of identifying the condition, we have changed the term from CDH to DDH. Right, sir. Now coming on to the option second, that is acetabular index more than 30 degrees. Now what is acetabular index? So if we uh, draw an X-ray, supposedly, uh, let's say if this is the femoral head now and this is the acetabular coverage surrounding it okay now acetabular index is if you draw a line through the triradiate cartilage that is the Hilgen renal line and another line we draw parallel to the acetabular roof now this what does this tell you this tells you supposedly the coverage of the acetabulum on the femoral head right now this angle this angle Imagine if there is good coverage, okay, imagine if there is good coverage like this. So, this angle will be less. So, remember that acetabular angle should be less. Now, how less we will talk about it. So, at birth, at birth, acetabular angle should be less than 30 degrees and it should keep on decreasing as the child grows because the acetabulum coverage increases as the child grows. So, supposedly, let's say at birth, it was like this. 
as the child grows it will become shallower because the coverage has increased so afterbirth uh, angle keeps on decreasing as the child grows now uh, it is common in premature birth is it true sir uh, you know developmental dysplasia of the hip joint is far more common in post mature birth now on the contrary majority of the developmental conditions are common in premature birth but this is one thing which is more common in post mature because by the time the there is a normal termination of the pregnancy is achieved there will be increased concentration of the hormone relaxin the role of relaxin is to relax the interpelvic and the femoroacetabular ligament of the mother in order to facilitate the childbirth that means in order to make the childbirth process easier for the uh, female for the mother but if the birth is postponed to post maturity then this increased concentration of relaxin will be reaching the fetal circulation and there it will relax the femoroacetabular ligament of the fetus now imagine if the pelvis or the if the acetabulum is already shallower in a child and there is increased concentration of relaxin then there will be further possibility of this dislocation to happen in that child that is why the post mature birth it is associated with post mature birth similarly it is more associated with oligohydramnios because of the crowding phenomena the child has to accommodate himself in a smaller space right the condition is associated with uh, uh, in in first born child the same phenomena that is crowding phenomena where the compliance of the uterus is less the stretching of the muscles in the uterus is lesser so less space is provided and the child has to accommodate himself or herself in a smaller space by over flexion of the joint and this over flexion might result in dislocation right so it is commoner in uh, mature uh, children in post mature birth it is commoner in comparison to the premature, pre-mature birth. birth so all uh, they are asking about the incorrect, incorrect option and obviously this is the answer for this question sir right so after index in ddh is more so what i told you that in normal children after angle is less than 30 but in ddh it is more than 30 degrees so this option is correct ddh but the option c is incorrect so answer here will be option c c now regarding treatment sir uh, sir before treatment sir hmm. uh, what is the role of ultrasonography because okay. this is also important right right so uh, so let's just briefly discuss the radiology aspect so coming to the what imaging modality is the modality of choice for uh, screening ddh now for best modality in a children is ultrasound okay remember it is ultrasound and on ultrasound what we see we see two angles we see two angles alpha angle and beta angle okay now just remember a mnemonic alpha means above so a for above alpha so normally normally what will be the normal values of alpha angle it will be more than 60 degrees and normal values of beta angle b for below less than 55 degrees so remember in a normal child alpha angle will be more than 60 degree beta angle will be less than 55 degrees now what is an alpha angle and what is a beta angle so first of all on ultrasound what we do at this level at let's say this level we put in our probe so this is the ultrasound probe that we put in on the hip of the baby okay i'll draw it opposite wise so i have to correlate with the x ray so on an ultrasound this will be the acetabular margin this will be the acetabulum that you see and this will be the femoral head that you will see okay so you will draw two lines one line you will draw parallel to this acetabular rim another line you will draw parallel to this acetabular roof okay now this angle that forms now this angle that forms this is known as the alpha angle okay now imagine a scenario in ddh that the acetabulum is shallow okay it is like this so what will be the what will happen to the alpha angle again we draw one line like this and we draw ag- another line like this so we see clearly that the alpha angle has decreased mm-hmm. right so remember whenever you will have a shallow acetabulum angle the alpha angle will reduce and hence remember in a normal child alpha angle is more than 60 degree now what is the beta angle so another line you draw you draw another line parallel to the acetabular head okay now this is the beta angle that we are talking about and remember beta angle normally is less than 55 degrees and abnormal 
any value above 55 degree is abnormal so this was about the ultrasound of ddh now for x-ray abnormality usually x-ray is usually done when uh, the ossification has occurred when the femoral head ossification has occurred and before that you have to do an ultrasound because you won't be able to see the femoral head on an x-ray else now we draw two important lines on x-ray first is the hilgen renner's line so this line is passing through the triradiate cartilage so this is the hilgen renner line and another line you draw that is known as the perkins line so uh, this is you draw through the lateral uh, margin of the ilium okay now in a normal a normal uh, femoral head which is on the right side that you see that the femoral head lies on the inferior medial compartment of this four box and on the left side you can clearly see that your femoral head is lying on the superior lateral aspect of this quadrant so this is uh, another finding that you see on ddh sir regarding the treatment yes sir so uh, you know why we have discussed this ultrasonography because you know the first thing that we have talked about in this question was that there is a change in the terminology from cdh to ddh now as we have talked about that there is we have to keep the suspicion index higher in order to identify those children where there is no displacement happened where there is no dislocation happened and in order to screen such a child that possibly they could be having a ddh we need to have this ultrasonography done because x-rays are are of no use in newborn right. so screening investigation of choice in case of a newborn is always ultrasonography yes why x-rays are of no use because head of the femur as well as the acetabulum both of them are cartilaginous by not the time right. so they are not identified on the x-rays so that is a very important point that has to be discussed now as far as the management is concerned you know the treatment in case of a newborn means early identification is the key sir as whenever it has been identified all we have to do the aim of the management is to keep the hip joint reduced aim is to keep the hip joint reduced once it is reduced it has to be kept in abduction because abduction of the thigh is the position in which the hip will be held reduced why the hip has to be reduced because with the growth of the head of the femur and acetabulum the acetabulum will be molded according to the shape of the head of the femur and that molding is only possible once both of them are in contact with each other if they are kept dislocated there will be no molding so for that in order to hold the thigh in abduction there are splints which are used like one is palikhanis and previously what was used was von rosen splint now as we can very clearly see the difference in between von rosen and pallik harness is that in von rosen splint the thighs are kept abducted but they are fixed in abduction there is no permissible movement at the level of the hip joint they are fixed in abduction and this fixed abduction for a long duration of time might be associated with the complication of avascular necrosis in the epiphyseal head of the femur that is why these splints are obsolete today we are not using these splints on the other hand the pelvic harness here the thighs are held in abduction but there is a permissible movement which is allowed at the level of the hip joint so they are not fixed in abduction so the possibility of this complication is extremely less that is why this is the kind of the uh, splint which is used in practice today in order to manage this condition in case of a newborn hopefully everything is clear Regarding. related to this uh, very yeah. important topic in future ddh developmental dysplasia sir they have asked about pelvic harness they have asked about ultrasonography multiple mm. of the times they have mm. asked about why ultrasonography or ultrasonography is the screening investigation yeah, of right. today yes right so at least this much is important for us to recognize in this condition on in this question next question sir yeah so l4 l5 spondylolisthesis which is the incorrect option now what do you mean by l4 and l5 spondylolisthesis now there are two important terms which we have to know first is spondylolisthesis and second is spondylolisthesis now spondylosis is uh, nothing but there is fracture of the pars interarticularis uh, of the vertebra now there can be fracture of the pars interarticularis but there can be no translation or dislocation of the vertebra in that case it is known as spondylosis if there is dislocation of one vertebra over the other then it is termed as spondylolisthesis okay. because it is a pre existing event right 
like spondylolysis lysis means break mm. if there is a break in the pars interarticularis that has happened it will eventually lead to displacement so first there is a lysis and after that there is lysis right so let's just briefly see what are we talking about so l4 l5 spondylolysis means now whenever we uh, are talking about the term spondylolysis we'll always talk about the upper vertebra in relation to the lower vertebra okay so here we see that the l4 is anteriorly translated as as relation to l5 so this is spondylolysis of l4 over l5 now which is the incorrect uh, option so let's see the first option l4 root compression now in this image we all know that uh, in the thoracolumbar vertebra the named vertebra let's say below l3 will exit the l3 nerve below l4 it will exit the l4 nerve and below l5 will have the l5 nerve so if there is translation of l4 over l5 so which will be the nerve that will be compressed yes it will be an l4 nerve so the first option l4 nerve root compression this is a correct option now sir uh, as sir has very well explained that l4 root will be compressed and there will be a posterior displacement because of the posterior displacement of this vertebral body it will also result in the compression of the cauda equina yes. and there will be a compression of the l5 also mm. and so because of the central compression of the l5 which has already about to get emerged at this level there will be a feature of l5 compression with this uh, particular uh, displacement that has happened and uh, you know dorsiflexion of the toes are affected when there is l5 compression and plantar flexion of the toes are affected when there is s1 compression mm. So that goes in the favor of more L4, L5 spondylolisthesis because it is a means co correlating it with the level of compression right, that right. has happened. So, sir, about yes. the next option. So, inverted Napoleon hat sign. So, just remember where is it seen? Which uh, in which spondylolisthesis it is seen? So, it is seen in L5 S1 spondylolisthesis. Now, whenever there is this is the L5 vertebra and this is the S1 vertebra. Now, imagine this. Imagine that uh, this is the sacrum and this is the L5 vertebra which has translated anteriorly over it. So, on the AP radiograph, on the AP radiograph, what do you see? You see that this, these are the white transverse processes of the L5 vertebra and this is forming a hat. Now, this inverted hat appearance is seen in typical appearance of an SL5 S1 spondylolisthesis and not L4 L5 spondylolisthesis. So, this is the incorrect option and hence this will be the correct answer in this question. Yes. Inverted Napoleon hat sign because spondylolisthesis is identified on the lateral view. Right. But inverted Napoleon hat sign, there are two specific findings. One, that it is at the level of L5 S1 which is happening. It appears like an inverted Napoleon hat. And the second thing that it is seen on the AP view only. Mm. So these are the two specific important. findings which are to be identified for this particular question. Next is numbness over the lateral aspect of the leg, dorsomedial aspect of the foot. Again, the feature which is suggestive of L4 and L5 root compressions. Right. Because in case of S1 uh, root compression, there will be numbness over the sole of the foot, over the more over the medial aspect of the leg that will happen in case of S1 compression. So, every other option is correct as far as clinical feature for this particular question is concerned. Uh, inverted Napoleon hat sign obviously is the answer for this question. Sir. Right. So, just... Yeah, because this is how the roots and the disc, if there is a disc dislocation, if there is a disc displacement, then what is the likely route which is likely to be affected and what are going to be their outcomes? You know, these things can happen at multiple levels. But as far as this, the commoner ones which are likely to happen is L5 and S1 compression. And you know, in case of S1 compression, ever, if, if an examiner decides to give you a question for S1 compression, then Achilles reflex will always be provided in that question because it is a direct association of the, uh, the jerk that has to be identified. All right. These are the two levels where almost every disc displacement is happening. So every time you get a question out of this particular table, then these are the two last ones which are very, very important for you to remember and point out the specific differences as far as clinical features are concerned. Like 
the dorsiflexion of the grade 2 is affected in L5 compression while the plantar flexion of the grade 2 is affected in case of S1 compression. This will always always be provided to you if they are asking about the specific nerve root compression in that particular question. Hopefully we get the answer because these kind of the questions are relatively confusing. Sir. Yes sir, yes sir. Uh, in making out the diagnosis because there are so many things which are overlapping. We right. cannot, the patient cannot specifically tell you that it is, is it the lateral leg numbness that the patient is having or the lateral foot numbness that the patient is having. Right, right, right. right. So that is the reason why this motor component involvement becomes important. That means the thing that you have to assess that you will identify the power of the dorsiflexors or the plantar flexors of the grade two. Right, sir, right, sir. We are, hopefully we are done with this question, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely. Let's move on to the next question. So a mother of a three-year-old girl came to the OPD with observa uh, observation of abnormal gait. On examination, she had genu valgum with intermalleolar distance of 6 cm, wrist widening and prominent abdomen. Logical markers reveal ALP of 1243 and a calcium of 9.8 mg per deciliter. What is the diagnosis? Uh, so what do we see in this given x-rays? Firstly, we see it is an x-ray of wrist. So let's discuss the options first. Now, first option is osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, now, in osteogenesis imperfecta, what typically the question will say is that uh, there are multiple fractures which are seen within the uh, x-ray and first of all, it will be an infant. Usually, very young people, very young children uh, get affected by the osteogenic imperfecta. You will get multiple fractures of varying stages of healing within the skeleton along with the question will give you abnormalities of the sclera, abnormal dentition, which are not given in this question. And second is arthrogryposis multiplex congenita. Now, sir. Uh, sir, the, in these kind, whenever we get these kind of the metabolic abnormality related questions, then ruling out the option is the best way to mark the correct answer. Like sir very well said, like osteogenesis imperfecta, these are the features which must have been there in the question, mm. which are obviously not there not in the question. question. So this thing can be safely ruled out. Arthrogryposis multiplex congenita where multiple joints are contractured, where there is a stiffness and the contractures observed in multiple joints. And the most obvious joints which are likely to be affected are the ankle one, the joints of the foot, the joints of the wrist and the metacarpophalangeal joints. So they are going to be stiffer and there will be uh, abnormality in the form of the deformities in that particular joint, but none of such thing has been mentioned in the question also. So this thing can also be uh, ruled out to right. some extent. And uh, third option is rickets. Now, uh, in this given question, it's a three-year-old uh, girl with abnormalities of gait, having a bony abnormality in the form of genu valgum, and the X-ray also shows typical findings that we see on uh, X-ray. So first is the metaphysial widening. So first, we what do we see? We see metaphysial widening. Second, we see there is cupping. Okay, we see there is cupping, there is fraying, there is fraying, and there is splaying of metaphysis. Now these are the three. These are the findings which are very very uh, very diagnostic of rickets. And in fact, these are the findings which are also used to uh, follow up rickets treatment as well. So remember, rickets. Whenever the rift X-ray is given in the question. Uh, Rickets should be looked at in the options yes, yes, very, very carefully. Yes, yes. means uh, orthopedic question asking about metabolic, metabolic abnormality, AP view of the risk, risk provided answer is rickets. rickets. Yeah, I mean, rickets most likely is the answer unless it's a tough question and a tricky question. Yes. Just me about close options. Hai. Exactly. Sir. You know, the language for the rickets related question will always be kept same. Like mm -hmm. mother will come with a complaint of deformity or abnormality in walking. Right, right. Because when the child starts walking, then it will become more obvious. Then they will become more impatient that possibly there is some abnormality which is happening. As far as x-rays are concerned, you are not going to get the x-rays of the knee. You are not going to get the x-rays of the hip joint or the scanogram involving the entire lower limb joints. You will get the x-ray of the wrist in order to diagnose the condition. Now. Normal calcium will always be provided to you and don't rule out rickets because it is the calcium which is maintained by excess parathormone. Here we are measuring the calcium of the blood, not that of the bones, not that of the reservoirs like muscles, not that of the skeletal, uh, nerve endings. We are measuring the calcium in the blood which is tightly regulated by excessive parathormone because parathormone has to maintain the blood calcium level back to normal. 
so it is a compensatory calcium which is kept inside the blood compensatory elevated calcium inside the blood so it will always be kept normal alkaline phosphatase obviously is the most consistent marker for rickets which will always be elevated right normal upper limit for the alkaline phosphatase is almost about 440 international units per liter here it is 1200 beyond 1200 so the most possible diagnosis obviously is the rickets so the one thing which is mentioned in the question like intermalular distance of six and because if the patient is having a genu valgum deformity where both the knees are pointing towards each other so we measure intermalular distance if it is six centimeters nothing has to be done if it is beyond 10 centimeters then external supports are to be provided so and in this case just medical management of this condition is more than sufficient right and just the past <laughs> comment on scurvy so remember scurvy uh, treatment mein, the x-ray that will be provided to you will be mostly a knee x-ray because knee findings are very typical of scurvy in the form of ring sign pelkins pearl trauma fields mm -hmm. uh lucent zone etc etc mm -hmm. which you guys know so rickets may you will be provided with a uh, wrist x-ray scurvy may you will be provided knee with a knee x-ray yeah. Uh, there is one more controversy which is associated with this it's the white line of Frankel. Right. They right. used to ask about white line of Frankel, and it is provided in majority of the books that uh, is it is seen in rickets. White line of Frankel is a feature of a scurvy. scurvy. Yeah, it's a feature. Never of in the never the feature of rickets. You know, although it is consistent with the observation that both of them there will be an increase in the density of the metaphysis end, but that white line of Frankel is a feature of a scurvy. Here also increase in the density of the metaphysical end is seen in case of rickets, but with the management of rickets. Uh, whenever this is it, how it will be identified yeah, yeah, that yeah. we are moving in the correct, correct direction, direction of metaphysis. Yeah, so whenever there is mineralization at the metaphysis, so metaphysis mineralization starts when you treat rickets and that time you see the mineralization of metaphysis happening and the, you see a little white line at the metaphysis and not whenever there is uh, a pathology uh, in rickets pre-treatment. So I think uh, that was all. Uh, regarding the orthopedics and radiology and questions, few important topics we discuss and we try to uh, give you a complete picture, a complete capsule of these four topics uh, with respect to orthopedics and radiology. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. All the best for you. All the best.